Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 one five five two to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio, uh, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Dennis Coffee is an American original. Only in America, and specifically only in Detroit, could one man play guitar with a group of legends as diverse as Del Shannon, The Temptations, George Clinton, and Funkadelic. However, the list of iconic artists, producers, and writers Dennis has worked with the world over only scratches the surface of what the man has done and the contributions he's made to the canon of popular music. Dennis Coffey first began to make his mark as a member of the Royal Tones, a group which had hits in the late 50s and early 60s and who performed sessions with other artists, including Del Shannon. From there, Dennis moved on to a distinguished run as a session guitarist for various labels, operating at the peak of Detroit's influence as a hub of musical innovation and commercial success. He's perhaps best known for his work as a member of the legendary Funk Brothers, backing a veritable trunk load of hits from Motown, specifically The Temptations, Classics, Cloud Nine, Ball of Confusion, and Just My Imagination. It is in those works that is introductory of the Wawa guitar sound to Motown first reared its head, and the resulting influence on all kinds of popular music continues to reverberate to this day. His work with The Temptations is just the tip of the iceberg, though he's on stuff like War by Edwin Starr, Band of Gold by Frida Payne, on and on as the list goes on. In the early 70s, Dennis struck out on his own as an artist film score producer. He scored the cult classic film Black Belt Jones. He recorded Scorpio in 1971 as part of his second solo record and first for Sussex Evolution. Scorpio was a million-selling single. It was a key foundational track in the history and development of hip-hop, totally apart from his status as a funk classic. Dennis is also featured in the 2002 film Standing in the Shadows of Motown, further combating his legacy as a key contributor to the development of some of the most cherished and important popular bands in the 20th century. So yeah, this man's important. This isn't just a history lesson, though. Dennis has continued to write and perform music. He's a lifer. Now it's time for a new chapter, an opportunity to both remind music fans what he's done and show them what's to come. Dennis is a cast member in the Sony film Searching for Sugar Man. He is also a co-producer and co-arranger, along with Mike Theodore, for some of the songs on the soundtrack. He also plays guitar and bass in some of those songs. Guitarist Dennis Coffey was that elite band of musicians who helped to create the Motown sound. Who said that? Edwin Starr. Please welcome legendary session guitarist, recording artist, producer, and author, Dennis Coffey, to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Dennis. Hello. I'm doing good, thank you. It's it's hard to get all your accomplishments in, you know. It's... I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> someone's got to do it. I, I can go on and on, but you know, then I wouldn't need you. <laughs> That's right. That's true. <laughs> you know, I, I want to first talk about the Royal Tones. I think they were a very underrated band. They were they were awesome, man. Um, some of the songs on there, like uh, you know, going swimming, and uh, you know, which is a incredible track that should have been a top 40 hit i know somewhere got lost in the shuffle 
And, and, and you know, the Yay Yay song, that, did, did the Beatles steal that from you guys? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, but you never know. <laughs> what a band. I, I, I was, you know, very intrigued. I got back into being a fan of the Royal Tones. Uh, you know, I saw the uh, the clip on Dick Clark's uh, American Bandstand. Uh, I mean, so many great songs. You, you a lot of um, um, you, you know uh, instrumental tunes, but there were you know some vocal songs as well. Uh, I saw another song. If you don't, kind of British Invasion R and B mix. I mean, these are the uh, the beginnings of so many you know great bands. Well, yeah, Bob Babbitt was with me, and you know, old brother Bob Babbitt, so right. he was the bass player with the Royal Tones also, so, yeah, we, we were all doing that stuff. What was it like back then in the beginning? I mean, this, you know, primarily was before the Beatles and the British Invasion and all that. Well, what was interesting is uh, when the Beatles came over here later on in life, I played with Ringo Starr and his Good Night Vienna album. Oh, I didn't know that. It was kind of interesting because, uh, you know, playing at Motown, back in those days, Motown and the and the Beatles were going head to head. You know, the British Invasion, the only company that was still with, with stood that invasion as to where it was Motown. They were still always in the top ten. I, I could hear a lot of the uh, precursor you know, to the Motown sound in songs like Our Faded Love. You know, I can see right. I can see where it all started, you know? Yes. And uh, the, the song Holy Smokes, which is a rocker, I mean, that sounds like Elvis's band later in life. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got a chance to do some stuff with James Burton. You know, I used him on a session in L.A., and then I played with him in London, and then I played with him down in... Uh, in Memphis for an event down there, man. He's a great guy and you know, great player. So you know, we got to be come a little bit friendly and stuff. That was that was very good. You know, I used to watch him on uh, Ricky Nelson's show. So we we're playing gigs together and stuff. It's pretty cool. Did, did you meet Elvis? Uh, I never did. Uh, I saw him live, but I didn't meet him. I saw him live at about thirteen because uh, I did meet Scotty Moore, the mm -hmm. guitar player, with uh, that was with him. But uh, I, I, my mom took me to hear him when I was about thirteen, and the girls were screaming so loud you couldn't even hear the band. I was a little disappointed in that part of it. What, what year was, was that? When in the fifties? Uh, yeah, that was probably I was uh, about thirteen. Then, so I was about fifty-three, I think. Oh, that was right in the beginning there, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I was into all that rockabilly stuff. In fact, uh, the first record session I did was a record called "I'm Gone" by Vic Gallon. Mm -hmm. You can go on YouTube. I was fifteen when I was hired for that session, and you can hear me do two rockabilly solos on that record. Man, you were way ahead of your time. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that's the whole idea of it, you know. This is try I think I, ha I have a short attention span, you know. So uh, what I needed to do was always try and try and be ahead of things. And, you know, uh, also when I got out of high school, I volunteered for the draft, and I was in the 101st Airborne Division. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, and Jimi Hendrix was down there about the same time as I was, uh -huh. and uh, the guys in his unit uh, uh, hit his guitar on him and wouldn't give it back. He was real unhappy, but uh, the guy who played rhythm guitar uh, for me was a guy named Bob, and he had uh, cut a guy up in a bar fight, so he was given the choice of join the Airborne or go to prison. Oh, my goodness. He was my wingman, so I saw him knock a guy out in the chow line for just taking cuts in front of us so nobody ever thought about hiding our guitars <laughs> so so you actually jumped jumped out of airplanes i sure did yeah. how, how many jumps did you have you remember oh probably only about seven because what happened is in jump school for the first two weeks you know you jump about five times right and later on due to cost you only can jump once every three months so I stayed in that outfit for about a year, and basically we were just waiting around for a war to happen. I got bored, so I transferred out of that and went down to Fort Jackson uh, for the last year. And uh, I was recording with Maurice Williams down there and a lot of different artists in Columbia, South Carolina. So uh, I was that way. I was working the clubs and doing all that stuff, and still, you know, being uh, being in the army. Now, now, this was was this before Vietnam? And what was interesting is because I volunteered for the draft right out of high school because I had two years, you know, and I figured that was my obligation. And I had two years without work because I was too young to work in the bars. So when I got out, uh, 
of the Airborne and the Army and all that, I was still only 20, so I went in the bars anyway. So I'm working in the bars at 20 up here. You had to be 21. And uh, the day before my 21st birthday, I looked at the front door and I recognized the vice cops coming in just because after two years in the Army, you get a little smarter, you know. So I dropped my wallet and put my foot on it because I saw them coming. And they come and wanted to see my ID, and I made a big deal looking for my wallet, even though it was under my foot. <laughs> and then they said, well, we're coming back tomorrow. And if you're not 21, we're going to give you a ticket and a bar ticket and all that stuff. So the next day, I was going to be 21 after midnight. So I was watching the front door. I figured I was in good shape then, you know, after airborne training. If they came in, I'd ran out the back door. They'd never catch me. So they never did come in. That <laughs> There's always some great Army stories, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you were in there, what, two years in the Army? Yeah, yeah, yeah. volunteered for the draft and went in and fulfilled my obligation. And then when I got out, uh, uh, once I uh, became 21, I was uh, when I got out of the Army, uh, I was out for two weeks, and then I joined a band six nights a week. Wow. That's, a, that's an incredible story. They did, uh, and uh, Hendrix, uh, did he see, did he, did he actually go to Vietnam? I think he did, didn't he? I don't know if he did or not. I don't think he did. Oh, he didn't make it to Vietnam. Huh. I think I think when we were both in there, I right. think uh, he was out before Vietnam, just like I was. You know, I respected Hendrix, because when they asked him about Vietnam, he says, I'm not going to say if I'm for it or against it, but I understand it. You know, he didn't put it down or anything. And, you know, you kind of respect him, because he was, he was in the military, and he, you know, he jumped sure. out of planes and... It, you know, and then there's all these guys that have never been in the military that, you know, put everything down and they don't know what it's like. You know, they have no idea. Well, I mean, you have an obligation because freedom is not free. You exactly. Know? That's the whole idea. So, and then if, if you're going airborne, you learn the difference. You know, the airborne guys don't play. I mean, that's where all the special forces guys come from and everything else, you know. So, uh, I still uh, go to meetings once a month with the special forces and airborne guys and everything, you know, that, that, were, that were in all the stuff. So it's a kind of interesting group. It is. You know, the, yeah. One guy, uh, he's a Green Beret uh, special forces guy, and on the back of his t-shirt, on the back of his sweatshirt, it says, "I do bad things to bad people." <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's a tough cookie. <laughs> yeah, you bet. That's for sure. Well, thank you for your service. I want to say that first. You're welcome. Yeah, my my my. I'm take care of my dad. He's 94, and he's an ex marine from uh, uh, World War II, which is not not too many of those guys left, you know. Yeah, my dad was in the Navy in World War II. Really? Is he still around, or did he pass away? No, no, he passed away. But uh, but he was in the Navy in World War II. He lost half a lung when uh, he got uh, the U boat sunk his ship in England. Oh wow! And also, they shrunk one of his lungs when he finally you know recovered from that. But uh, really. He was in the Navy. Yeah, my father-in-law was in Germany. He passed away, but he was a point man in Germany in World War II. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a point man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. So uh, all I can say about the Royal Tones is they were way uh, underrated. Uh, they kind of started things off for a lot of great bands in the future. They're, you know, I, I love listening to those mu that, those songs. I really do. Well, you know, we were working in bars uh, six nights a week as the Royal Tones, and finally, after three years, I think people were getting a little tired of it, so we worked the Jersey Shore all summer. So that was pretty cool. But, uh, but summer's point. So we worked that, and then after that, you know, we were kind of we came back here. And, uh, the work wasn't here for us. That's when we kind of split up. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you worked with Del Shannon, right? Yes, yes. Uh, we. Uh, the first work with Del Shannon, when we work at Summers Point, we drove down to New York City at Bell Sound and recorded uh, uh, with Del. You know, we did uh, uh, Handyman, uh, we did uh, Little Town Flirt, and uh, uh, a couple, he has a, a million sellers. The first yep. million seller I played on was with Del Shannon. Well, one of my favorite bands, and I'm still friends, uh, I keep in touch with Peter Rivera, it's always okay. been it's always been rare earth. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and you well, were Gil, uh, Gil Bridges lives here in Detroit. I see him once in a while. Oh, does he? He, huh. bought, he bought the name from Pete. Yeah, I know. Oh. Yeah, I don't and think. It's, I, I it's think there's some bad blood there. Gil, Gil found a singer, uh, 
a drummer out of Lansing, that sounds quite a bit like Pete was kind of surprising. You uh-huh. know, the guy can do all that stuff. But they're still on the road, as far as I know. They, I, I think Pete goes out with a different bunch of people. Yeah, Pete, I've seen Pete a lot of times uh, now, and he, he sounds the same, man. He sounds great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I heard. Well, you were on you were on their first their debut album, Dreams and Answers, and you produced yeah. that album. Yeah, Mike Theodore and I did, and uh, the guitar player got lost the first day of recording, so I had to play guitar on it because he somehow got lost and so didn't show up for the session. I th- that was what Rod Richards, Rod Richards, yeah. I think, right? It was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what kind? What kind of dog? What kind of dog you got? <laughs> uh, you know, it's my grand dog. It's my son's dog. She's uh. <laughs> A basset and uh, on a part Sharpay. Oh wow! She's barking at another dog across the street because so, she thinks she owns the neighborhood. <laughs> they all do. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's what they do. Yep. Well, you played a lot too. Uh, I always have trouble. Is it Ray Monet? Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Ray Monet. Yeah. Oh, uh, Monet. Yeah. R- Ray is a great guitar player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met him a couple of times. Uh, nice guy. And yep. uh, you know, I, he he was very important to that rare earth sound later and later, like after the seventies, you know. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Ray and I uh, played when when Holland Dozier and Holland uh, uh, started their own label, Hot Wax, and everything. Uh, Ray Manette and I played on those earlier sessions, and then when Ray was a member of Rare Earth. He wasn't available for the session, so uh, uh, Ray Parker Jr. Uh, became the other session guy over there instead of Ray Manette later on. Yeah, I think Ray picked up your Wawa. He does a lot of that. Yeah, 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 he does, yeah. Good player. Good good player. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to talk about, the, uh, of course, the Funk Brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when, when I think of them, you know, they're, they're just so... In, instrumental to the uh, Motown sound, uh, and, and you know, then there's that other group, the Wrecking Crew, who were very important to that top forty, you know, uh, sound as well. Did you, right, did sure. you did you know some of those guys from the Wrecking Crew? Uh, I think I did one session with Hal Blaine out there. With Hal Blaine, who we just lost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But other than that, uh, uh, I, w- I was mainly doing sessions at Mo West, and uh, you know, I work with everybody out there. I work with uh, Quincy Jones, and I work with uh, Ringo Starr, and I work with uh, uh, Tom Jones, and uh, a lot of different people out there. So when I was in L.A., I, I did the thing for about three years, and I got bored and came home. Well, uh, yeah, I'm a big Motown fan as well. I grew up in the D.C. area, you know, which was okay. kind of kind of a mini uh, Detroit. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, we we, we grew up with played at Constitution Hall down there. I remember. Yeah, Constitution Hall. You're right. Yeah, yeah. great place. Yeah. And uh, I think you were telling, uh, you're saying that Norman Whitfield and Marvin Gaye were the, probably the two most important people, right, to to the Motown sound. Well, well Marvin Gaye uh, was very important to Motown. Uh, Norman Whitfield was the one that, uh, uh, when he used me on Cloud Nine with that Wawa pill, that's what he was looking for. He was the guy that was moving Motown into the, the, the day of the protest songs and all those kind of things, where Motown had been doing all the uh, relationship songs and so forth. So Norman was the one that... Uh, because he could see this whole Vietnam War thing, you know, right. Song War and all the other stuff I played on. You know, so Norman was the one that was taking Motown into current social protest. And then Marvin kind of, when he did the, What's Going On, he kind of got involved in that. And then I did, a, uh, I did I Want You Back with Marvin. I did that whole album with him out in L.A. And Marvin, bless his soul, was smoking a joint the whole time. So what can I say? <laughs> Hey, I love Marvin Gaye. You know, yeah, he, very cool. He was cool. You know, I I, I read the, saw the story about him that you know when he got help, he went to uh, vi- with a family. I think it was in Amsterdam or something that he lived uh-huh. in. Yeah, he lived in, with a family. You know, in Amsterdam, the guy was a promoter, and they yeah. helped him. You know, because he he was very much in the drugs, but he, uh, he 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 came from that. And when he left, he, he that's when he started coming doing a comeback and. Had some great comeback hits, but uh, he was also a good drummer, right? What I understand, uh, he was, but I, I never encountered him playing drums. You know, uh, he was just, uh, you know, when I did the album with Ringo, Jim Keltner and Ringo were both playing drums on that thing. Right. 
Yeah, Keltner's another good drummer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, you worked with uh, James J- uh, Jamerson, who was a incredible bass player. Oh yeah, he was my best friend at Motown, and, and that's how I got to Motown. Is uh, I knew everybody was lined up for that those musical chairs at Motown, so I just ignored the whole thing and went about my business. And then uh, uh, they called me. You know, Jamerson called me up one day and uh, says, "This is you know." He saw me in the clubs a little bit, and he said, uh, "He wanted to introduce me to Hank Cosby." And Hank Cosby said uh, uh, they they put together a producers workshop for the producers to experiment in the Golden World Studios, you know, upstairs. So four nights a week they put me on a retainer, and it was Jamerson's band. And so we were in that workshop, and a couple months we were in there, and the Norma Whitfield came in with a chart on a song called Cloud Nine, and mm-hmm. said he wanted to run it down. And I threw a wow wow pillow on the front, and Norman said that's what I want. And within two weeks, I was playing it for the Temptations, and that was it. Norman had me all the time over there, and then uh, everybody else for you start using me over there too. And then at night, I would go work for Holland Dozier and Holland, and do Free to Pain and Chairman of the Board and all that other stuff. Well, the Free to Pain song, Band of Gold. I mean, how, how many times do we still hear that on the radio? Uh, yeah, and I, I had the Coral Electric sitar, and that was, that was a written part. You know, that that fixed the fit with everything. Yeah. And uh, that, that's kind of how that happened. At the same time, I was doing uh, the dramatics, you know, in the rain, and what you see is what you get. And then I was going down to Muscle Shoals and Wilson Pickett doing Don't Knock My Love and all that other stuff. So it was fun. Times were busy. How, how did that process work? I mean, you know, you invented a lot of the guitar licks, but how did you mix that in with the music? Was, was there music already established? Oh, absolutely, yeah. At, at Motown, uh, and, and mainly as a session musician, you have to be able to sight read. I mean, there was uh, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I remember Jay Graydon as a guitar player, producer out in L.A. He and I were studying sight reading from this uh, conductor of the Palace of Ruby Symphony just to get better at that. But at Motown, uh, they gave us a master rhythm chart, which had all, you know, the three stabs of the different parts on it. And uh, our job first was to read the arrangement, because they had great arrangers. You know, Paul Reiser, I just saw him last week, and uh, David Van Der Pitt and some of the arrangers that Motown had. So uh, that was the first job. I mean, you walked in uh, for a three-hour session, you walked in at 10 o'clock, and your job in that first uh, each hour was mainly to read a chart of a song you never saw before, read the chart correctly, come up with a feel, and record one song an hour with no mistakes and make them a hit. That's wow. what we did. Jeez, I give you guys a lot of credit, man. You you guys are what made it all happen. Well, I mean, the, the whole thing is that we got good at it because we did it every day. I was doing double sessions every day, and right. then I was doing HTH at night and everything and all that stuff. So uh, when you have a group of guys like the Funk Brothers, I mean, that was probably the greatest rhythm section I ever played with and was a part of uh, for years. I mean, when you get guys like that, we were all friends and stuff, and you play together every day like that, you get real good at it. Did, did you like working in the Motown uh, studios? Oh, yeah, we all had fun. I mean, yeah. we did our job. And uh, like I said, we were friends, you know, so we, uh, uh, and we had fun doing it. I mean, that was the whole thing. I mean, we, we were comfortable working with each other. And that, that was what people don't really understand is the Funk Brothers worked together as a team. Right. We, we learned teamwork. We made our jobs easier by working with each other. You had no showboaters. I mean, everybody, we came in and did the job, made the producer and the, and the, uh, Ranger happy, and we played together. We, you know, the guitar section. We used to sit, me and Joe Messina and Eddie Willis, and even Robert. We'd divide the guitar parts up to make it easier on ourselves. You know, that's what we did. Yeah, I'm glad there wasn't any showboats. That would have made things a lot difficult. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was uh, you had to. It was the team, and 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 what what it made it interesting is that we all bounced a feel off of each other. So you had 11 guys in there. If you made a mistake, they had to stop the tape. Right. And we did, you know, one song an hour with the 11 guys, and we kind of, that vibe. Nowadays, they do a computer and a drum track, and yeah. one guy at a time. They're missing that synergy of 11 guys bouncing ideas and <laughs> feel off of each other. That's what's missing nowadays, unless they have a live band doing it. You know, I don't care how much producing you do and, and mixing you do today, to try to get the sound good. There's nothing like that original sound from those yeah. four, those 45s, you know, back in the 50s uh-huh. and 60s. Sure. Very clean sound, you know. They can't yeah. copy that, you know. They really no, can't. No. 
Well, that's, uh, again, nowadays the, 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 the operation as a keyboard guy to a drum track, and then everybody comes in one guy at a time. And I did a couple of those sessions, and the guy said, you know, you guys must have had so much fun playing with everybody together at the same time. We don't get that. Yeah. You know, we overdub parts, and Steve Luca there at Toto told me, he says, I yep. can take... I could do 11, I could, I could do over double part a thousand times if I want, because cause we can do it. You guys had to do it all at once, and at the same time with no mistakes, and do one song an hour. He says, I really respect that. Yeah, today, today they, when they make an album, you know, they get all the artists to send MP3s, you know, email them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what happens. On, on the last album I did, I had some different singers on it, uh, and uh, uh, they just uh, sent it uh, on the Internet over there to wherever they lived, and they overed up their part and sent it back. That's, that, that's, that. that's no fun. <laughs> yeah, it just wasn't. It wasn't to me. <laughs> You know, what? one of the most influential songs, you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, protest songs and this and that, whatever, Edwin Starr's War. And, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that lives on and, and could, you know, every generation, it just fits in. I, I loved Edwin Starr, man. He was, he was incredible. Oh, he was a great guy. I got a chance to, uh, I was playing, uh, uh, I was doing a book tour overseas. Right. And my publisher knew Edwin. So Edwin was living over in, in the U.K. by then. And uh, we went to hear, he was doing live shows. So we went to hear one of his live shows with a, like, he had about a 11-piece band and everything. And and I got to hang around with him uh, for about an hour, you know, before the show. Right. And I had, worked, I had worked with Edwin at Golden World. So I knew him from there, you know. Then I got a chance to see him over in the U.K. He was just such a great singer. What a nice guy. Very cool. So talk about making, uh, doing the war uh, session. What was that like? Well, you know, that was a, just a typical uh, the Funk Brothers, and uh-huh. Norman was uh, was the guy. You know, Norman Whitfield was always a master of dynamics. You know, he'd always be breaking it down. And yeah. He'd, he'd be always standing in front of Uriel and Pistol, the drummers. That's where he stood. He was never in the control room. Huh. Norman, when we did the rhythm tracks, he's always in front of the drummers, and he'd be doing breakdowns, you know. Well, everybody stop, and I just want to hear a hi-hat over here, and I'll cue you in and all that. That That's what his whole, one of his uh, great skills was the, master of dynamics Norman Whitfield right. was yeah we need more guys like that today I mean that's we're missing well, yeah. that. well we need more budgets we need going to go in a studio and uh, the last album I did on myself I did it with everybody I, I, I don't never do the, the way that everybody else does I don't do that yeah I go in and do an album I'll I bring the whole band in together and we'll do the album we'll do the solos and everything we don't overdub and do that because at Motown I never overdubbed uh, a ball of confusion right. throws it just by we didn't over Yeah, yeah. I talked. I talked to uh, Billy Cobham once in a while. We were talking about the Spectrum album. Okay. Oh, uh, you know that was loose. You know they did that really quick, and you know they had a few mistakes in there. They left them in, and uh, they had a good time, and it was a great album. <laughs> yeah, I mean you have to look at the feel. You know, you. I mean, yeah, there, there might be a few blemishes, I call them, but not if you have a real outright glaring clinker of the wrong chords that really doesn't fit in it. You know, but generally, if it's a little a minor issue as long as you got the feel it's better i mean the feel is what it's about not about whether you have a minor mistake or not yeah today everything's overproduced you know and it's just sure. it's 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 a you know, totally different scene today i'm not happy with it i i was a top 40 dj also back in the late 70s and you know i've seen okay. a, lot of, a lot of changes and i, I yeah yeah know. i mean nowadays the producer's the ruler and he plays keyboards usually yeah and he writes all the material and all this kind of crap you know instead of having a live band go in there and really you know really deliver on that level but sometimes i think the keyboard as producers get carried away with what they want and right they want to do the click track and all the other stuff which just kind of makes the stuff i think very stilted you know i i uh, there's an interview with frank zappa on uh youtube which i love he, uh, he was talking about, you know, because his music was very innovative and, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff what didn't make it to the radio. And he was saying the guys that took a chance on music were those cigar-chomping guys, old guys that didn't know anything yeah. about it. But they, they, let's take a chance, you know? And yeah. the, the guys that were he was fearful of were the young guys that thought they knew everything because they, they, they thought they knew everything. They wouldn't play anything they didn't like. And that's he was right yeah. about that. Well, that that was the whole thing, you know. I I, uh, I had one time uh, 
somebody on us doing a little session in L.A. wrote on the chart, play this like David T. Walker. I said, well, why the hell did you call David? Was he busy? <laughs> I don't play like David T. You want David T. sound like David T. Exactly. Don't tell me like play like him. Exactly right. You also did, uh, you worked with a, another group, which was not Motown, uh, the band Gallery, which I remember. They yes. did, nice to be with you was a big hit, and you worked with yeah. them as well. Yeah, yeah, in my theater. We, uh, we kind of uh, applied that. We were going to put that group out with Clarence, and, uh, and uh, uh, they wouldn't let him put out any pop music, and we kind of stuck it in anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And Buddha got mad at us and him, too, because we had a big pop hit, and Buddha told Clarence, we didn't hire you to do pop music, that's what we do. <laughs> but before they knew it, we had a smash hit with the gallery. That's amazing. You know, that's totally different. You're doing a, a 180 there. Huh. And, uh, of course, you did Black Belt Jones. You did that, yep. the score for that. Uh, I don't know, why, why didn't Curtis Mayfield or Isaac Cage call you, you know, for uh, <laughs> Shaft and... Uh, uh, what's the Curtis Mayfield? He did, uh, it's got Freddy's Dead on it, and, um... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I saw Curtis, I opened up for him in, uh, Philharmonic in New York, you know, so he was, he's really a great guy, like, yeah. uh, loved what he was doing, but then, you know, Theodore and I discovered Rodriguez and got that whole thing going, so you had a whole nother deal happening with him, I mean, we, we knew it would be a hit, but it took the, the public in a movie 30 years later, 40 years later to catch up with Rodriguez. Yeah, that's true. Huh. That's an interesting story. I saw the movie. Yeah. I saw the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I opened up for Rodriguez in London and, uh, Manchester about four years ago. You know, I, uh, opened up and, uh, played with the band there. So what's he doing now? Uh, you know what? I don't really, uh, I'm not sure what he's doing. Uh, we, we, you know, Rodriguez is kind of, he's always been, uh, you know, every time Theodore, Mike Theodore and I would hook up with him, he'd say, well, I'll meet you on the street corner over here by the beer store or something. He'd be wandering around the neighborhood of Wayne State with a oh. wine flask on his back. That's really? how we held our meetings with Rodriguez. Very secretive guy, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 he was always that way. Yeah, you, you were on his first album, right, Cold Fact? In, uh, we discovered him, me and Mike yeah. Theodore got him a deal. And when we first uh, saw him at the sewer, by the river there in Detroit, he was singing and facing the wall. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're looking at the back of his head, saying, "Hmm, who is this guy?" You know, <laughs> that's so weird. We listened, but that you know, it was kind of forced you to listen to the songs. But he was he, but he, that's how he performed in those days. He faced the wall. Huh? That's a that's that's crazy. Yeah, he's a different yeah, guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and we couldn't get him in the studio. He was so shy. Right. That we. Uh, we we brought him in the studio by himself and recorded four songs, the first four, and we built the band around him after he left. Huh. And then, then we got him used to coming in the studio with the musicians. But that first four songs, uh, he wouldn't do it. So we brought him in by himself and recorded him and his guitar, and then we brought the musicians in later and kind of built them around the track. That's interesting. Very interesting yeah. guy. Yeah. I, you, you wrote a book, which I wish I had. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and buy it. Guitars, oh. bars, and Motown superstars. Correct. Uh, do you have some great stories in there? Oh yeah, you know, and, and I, I I tried to not overanalyze it, and I tried as a writer, right, make it entertaining, not you know, and and I got so tired of people writing books about music that weren't there, right, and so because they weren't there, they're relying on the biases and opinions of others who were. So I always felt that uh, I'm going to tell my story because I was there, mm -hmm. and I'm going to write a book to do it, and I could, and I did. I didn't have a ghostwriter. I mean, I can write, you know. So uh, I wrote many training manuals and everything, so I know how to write. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm an author, too, and I respect that, you know, because there's so yeah. many so many bestsellers that, oh, yeah, I, I like to write, you know, and they, they haven't done anything. It's all ghostwriters. No, no. And, and I... Uh, and I uh, made it a positive book and somebody from LA says where's all the dirt uh, yeah I'm not about writing about dirt I know I know a lot about it, that, that stuff well sure there's you can find that in anything but that that's not what it's about music is a positive and I'm a positive guy I don't believe writing about crap just to sell books that'd be absurd amen brother <laughs> I, yeah. I I do thousands of interviews and I don't do any dirt at all it's all about the oh. music <laughs> Yeah, you can always find dirt on anybody. We're right. all human, but 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 uh, you know, if you're 
looking at a positive accomplishment of being successful in the in the music business, why would you want to show the dark side That's of right. everybody? Everybody's got one. Why don't you just show the positive things that tie into their accomplishments and let's celebrate, you know, what they've done. You know, music music gets people through life. You know, music yes. people timeline their 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 life with music. I do yeah. all the time. You yeah. know. Yeah, and what I do is, uh, I, I know I used to, uh, uh, for one year straight, I was in uh, uh, three songs in Billboard in the top 10, right. and 10, 10 songs in the top 100 for a year straight. Well, I remember when Scorpio came out. It was awesome, you know. Everybody, oh, yeah. everybody loved that song. I remember I was playing in Brooklyn in a hotel. It was a 20,000, they had a, a, a 2,000 crowd in a, a big hall upstairs of the hotel. And we started, uh, we, you know, played some of our songs, you know, and then I started going into Scorpio and I looked up and there was a Kaga line of 2,000 people booking towards the bandstand. I said, oh no, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> they, things uh, get big very fast when you yeah, have a hit yeah. record. <laughs> Did you have was Bob Babbitt on bass on that track on yeah. that song? Yeah, yeah, he was, you know. And uh, I let him take that bass solo. That bass solo helped yeah. him that record. It was such a tremendous bass solo, which you never heard bass solos, you know. So he just took off and did his thing. How, how'd you come up with that song? What? what was uh, you know what? I uh, I had a bunch of songs. What I did is I was sitting in the basement with my sound on sound tape recorder, and right. I was doing a guitar band thing. So I wrote ten songs. Did the guitar band thing overdubs just to show Mike Theater what I was talking about, and he convinced Clarence to come up with the budget. So that's where that song came from. And we went. I never named my songs. I just put numbers on them, and then uh, <laughs> Mike them kind of name them. So, so how'd you come up with the name? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm a Scorpio, so I. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I always think of the movie when I think of it. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That that song hit. I think it hit number six on Billboard Hot 100, and it hit number yeah. nine on the Soul Charts. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. It was it was a gold record. That was my first gold record. I I, I was listening to um, you. You did a um, it, you know the Isley Brothers Brothers. It's my thing instrumental right. on YouTube, which was incredible. The Isleys also, Skip Pitts was the guy who played on the original. Right. And I got to know Skip Pitts when he came up here and played. And so we did, like, dueling wah-wahs at the House of Blues in New Orleans, me and Skip. It was crazy. We had a great time. Yeah, the Isleys, the, uh, they're still around. They did a, uh, a an album with Santana, which was cool. Okay, okay. Yeah. You know, the 70s were a great time for funk and R&B. And oh, it, yeah. Sure was. It was incredible, man. And, and yep. And I mean, you had like bands like the Ohio Players, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Cool and the Gang, the Commodores. Yeah. You know, what, what did did you uh, did you get involved a little bit with the seventies bands as well, or? I uh, no, you know, well, I stayed in Detroit. I, stayed, I lived in L.A. for three years, seventy three to seventy six. So I worked with some different people out there. But uh, generally, you know, I've, I've uh, pretty much. Uh, I'm in Detroit, and Detroit is what it is right now, and it's, yep. uh, there's music everywhere in Detroit all the time. Always been. You know, so uh, so that, that, that's my uh, connectivity to the people, and I play every Tuesday night. I've been at the same place for 11 years. It's two miles away from the uh, Motown Museum. I'm at Northern Lights Lounge, so in my career, I've come two miles, so I'm happy. That's all right. It works. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's That sounds like a great gig, man. Oh, yeah. Super. Uh, another big guy, uh, James Brown, and uh, I, I love Sly and the Family Stone. I, it's a shame, so, yeah. so it's a shame what happened to Sly. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Did, did you did you know James Brown at all? Uh, I never met any of those guys. I worked with Wilson Pickett. He was the only one of those guys that I worked with. What? what there, nobody. There is nobody like Wilson Pickett, man. He, he oh had, yeah, he, he was uh, the guy. He had that scream. Nobody could do. He that. did. <laughs> He was the real deal. Wilson was. He was the real deal. I love yep. Wilson Pickett. Well, you you got a uh, a new album out, right? Live at Baker's. Uh, live at Baker's, and I got one following it uh, already next week. You're kidding me? Uh, uh, yeah, it's called Down by the River. It's uh, on uh, Mac Avenue's Detroit Music Factory. That's coming out next week. Oh, really? Wow, that was uh, quick. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, 
you know, I'm happy. Two albums within one month. That works for me. Unbelievable. Well, I love Lion at Baker's, man. I gave it five stars. Well, excellent. Appreciate that. That it's got uh, it's got Scorpio on it. It's got covers yep. of Miles Davis, The Temptations, yep. Jimmy Smith. You know, uh, people don't realize that uh, you know I was I was playing jazz back in the day with Lyman Woodard and Melvin Davis. And I used right. to hang out with Wes Montgomery all the time when he came into town. So I was a, uh, I mean Wes was my guitar idol as far as jazz goes, and George Benson's great too. All these guys. So mm-hmm. I you know studied the jazz guitarists, all of them, Barney Kessel, all those guys. So they were the forerunners of the jazz guitar, which is very cool. Well, I love the album, man. You, the Just My Imagination, to me, is one of those licks that I remember, you know, yeah. as, from Motown. It, to me, the, the yeah, number I think, one. Yeah, I created that lick on the fly in the intro. I just made it up on the spot. And yeah. That's like my girl, you know, that, that lick. Exactly. Is, everybody knows that. And when I play it in the club and say I did this, they can hear that it's me. Yeah. They can hear it because I play it just like I did it on the record. That's so cool. How cool is that? <laughs> and you got uh, all blues live. Uh, it it kind of uh, reminded me a little bit of Jeff Beck, you know, the style. Uh-huh. Okay. All yeah, right. yeah. And, and, and you showed off a lot on uh, Dink's Blues. That that was you showing yeah. off, right? <laughs> yeah, you just go do what you do, and then tomorrow is another day and another uh, musical moment, you know? Everyone's got to listen to Dink's Blues on, on the album. It's a it's cool. an incredible. That's good. Yeah, incredible. Well, I lo- love the album, man. It's awesome. When, when is the next one coming out again? Uh, probably next week. Next week. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Well, we'll we'll make sure we uh, promote that one too and, and put it Absolutely. on all the websites. Down by the river. It's on uh, Detroit Music Factory, which is under Mac Avenue Records. And that is that a, is that a live album? No. Uh, it's it's live in the studio, but okay. not in the club. But uh, I'm an artist now signed to Mac Avenue Records, so Mac I'll Avenue. do one album a year from that for them. I'll be doing one album a year, so I got to get busy and record another one. Oh, great! Well, they're ne- demanding, huh? Yeah, there <laughs> just, you go. Just like the old days. That's it, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I'm a pain to do music. Wow, that's creative. <laughs> You were inducted into the Michigan Rock uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Congratulations yes. on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so many great artists from Michigan, man. I always say that yeah. the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame should have been in Michigan, not Ohio. I always thought that myself, but I'm surprised how they let it be in Cleveland. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't get that. You know, everything everything happened in Michigan. Yeah, but they got the Motown Museum here that's uh, expanding as we speak. That's oh, that's cool. Yeah, I want to come. I donated a 335 Gibson guitar to them. Did you really? Oh man. Yeah, so they uh, so they've got that. I put it, set it up, and everything right where I used to sit. That 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 was your favorite guitar, wasn't it? No, no, my favorite guitar is the Firebird that I use all the sessions and the 345 I use in the sessions. I still have those. Right. You, you were on a show on PBS, uh, History Detectives? Yeah, yeah, me and uh, James Jamerson Jr., I think, about an amplifier. It, it, was, uh, it was his dad's. What, was it his dad's, I guess? Well, uh, uh, he claimed it was, and I thought it was, and later they claimed it wasn't, so I don't know. Oh, they, they never I thought it was at the time, and, uh, you know, Jr. should know if it's his dad's amp. Right, you would think so. Yeah. Well, Dennis, here, here's a question I ask everybody, and I get some interesting answers. Uh, if you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, uh, to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? And you work with so many people. Uh, you know what? I, uh, I pretty much, there's nobody that, that just, oh, I have to work with that person, because I've worked with pretty much everybody. I mean, who haven't I worked with, actually? I mean, there's a few people, you know, but I played in Europe and Paris, and Barcelona, Spain, and I've been in Germany, you know, you know stuff like that. So I, I really don't know, <laughs> Just, you know, and and then because you don't, I don't know. The phone yeah. rings and someone wants to work with me, you know. That's true. So it's not, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Yeah, you're still a young guy. I am. Yeah, and there's a lot of guys still touring in their eighties, you know. Well, uh, touring to me got to be a pain, you know. I, I toured a lot in 2011 to support an album with Strut Records, which is based in London. Right. But after that, you know, uh, I don't need a tour anymore. Yeah. It takes a lot out of you. It really does. It does. Yeah, it does. So is there, is there anything in your life you would have done differently? Uh, let 
mean, you learn from experience and from your mistakes. Uh, one thing I probably would have done if I had time was I would have got my college degree when I was at Wayne. Instead, I had to go back later and get my bachelor's and master's. But I think I would have tried to finish the degree when I was there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just ran out of time because I was so busy with music. But I went up, went back later and got it. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, I got a master's and a bachelor's degree. Ah, congratulations. Yeah, I wish I had done that, too, as well. I, I didn't, but I had a broadcasting. Uh, I, I went to, like, a technical school that was owned, actually, by CBS, so I learned radio and television there. Okay. Yeah, and they, they you know what I liked about them? They had a, uh, a job placement, so they would get you started right away. Right, good. Which was cool. Good. So do you know any of the guys, uh, the legends in, in Michigan? That uh, You know who I had on the show recently before you was Don Brewer from uh, Grand Funk. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know him that well. Uh, you got Alice Cooper. You got, uh, I, I interviewed uh, uh, Susie Quattro. I know Susie a couple of times. Uh, no, none of those guys. None of those no. guys. Yeah, yeah they're, they're later, I guess. <laughs> well, I was a Motown guy. You're all Motown. You know why... Uh, uh, my, my dad had a store on F Street in D.C., and we met a lot of guys. He had drinks with Al Green. Uh, okay. I, I sold a pair of binoculars to Luther Ingram, which was cool. Okay. Back in his day, he, he was a cool guy. And, and I did meet, yeah. the, I met the Temptations uh, later in life because they stayed, they, they did a lot of benefits in D.C. and everything. And okay. They, they were incredible. The, it's, my favorites were always the Temps and uh, the Four Tops. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mine too. <laughs> yeah. Dennis, anything else you want to promote or chat about? Uh, just that's it. I got to run out of here and go on an appointment here, but uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything that I could think of. The new CDs coming out of yep. my book. You got Live at Bakers, which is out. You got the, uh, I'm going to promote the book. And an another another album, One Night at Maury's, is, it was uh, released not that long ago either. That That's Last another. Year. That was out last year. Last year. That was a great, that's a great album. Yeah, and also Northern Lights Lounge in Midtown Detroit. Okay, awesome. Dennis, thank you so much, man, for being on the show today. Okay. Keep, keep up the good work. You're a legend. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll touch bases again with you. All right, good. All right, thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye now. Goodbye. Yeah, for more information about Dennis Coffee, please visit www.dennisscoffeesite.com. Uh, Purchase the most uh, recent release from Dennis Coffee Live at Baker's uh, by Dennis at Amazon.com. Also, uh, last year he released One Night at Maury's, another incredible album from 1968, which you can also purchase at Amazon.com. From rock and roll kid to honorary member of Motown's elite rhythm section, the Funk Brothers, Dennis Coffey was one of Detroit's most in-demand session guitarists. After leaving Motown, Coffey became a regular at Hitsville, USA, playing on records for Marvin Gaye, The Supremes, Stevie Wonder, Gladys Knight, and Junior Walker. Most recently, he appeared in the documentary Standing in the Shadows of Motown. You can purchase this incredible journey, a book by Dennis Coffey entitled Guitars, Bars, and Motown Superstars, also available at Amazon.com. Very special thanks to the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of VBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of Interviewing the Legends. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, please contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho, for the very latest interviews. It's real news, people. Have a great week! Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1555. Or visit us at publicityworksagency.com Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio Station 1.